my good friends, and today I am here with a mystery box book haul. So I ordered a mystery box of 25 or 20 historical fiction books off eBay. It came in this thing. Yes, I do have something on my arm because I broke my wrist. But um, so I'm going to get started opening and we'll see what I got. So, originally it was priced at $14.99, and I made an offer for $11 on eBay. He didn't want that. And, again, I made an offer, I went back and made an offer for $12. <laughs> and $12 was enough. And I did make a request for no romance, but we'll see. Let's see what we got. John McDonald won Faith, fearful yellow eye. Lori Doyle has been one of the broken birds. McGee has taken her abroad. McGee has taken her aboard the busted flush, patched her up, and turned her loose to make another try at life. Now she was calling for help again. Someone had very quietly, very skillfully extracted $600,000 from her, from her husband during the last painful year of his life. Blackmail? Obviously. But the how and the why of it baffled McGee until he began to detect the lingering, unpleasant odor of sadism. Until he began to turn up the nasty little bits of evidence left by someone who preferred to maim rather than kill. Someone who liked to watch and savor the agony of his victim. That sounds dark. Okay, let's see what year this was published. 1966 and it looks like it too all right and now we got white apache that's racially sensitive it is 1857 under president james buchanan terrible president the battle lines for america's coming conflagration are being violently drawn as the burning question of slavery scorches the nation, another savage war takes shape in the West. In the far-off New Mexico territory, blue-coated soldiers hurl a challenge against the implacable Apaches. Surrender or die. And in the Indians' ranks stands the brave called, stands the brave called Sunny Bear, the powerful blonde-haired warrior and medicine man. Once his name was Nathaniel Barrington, one of the finest officers in the United States Army. Now his visions guide him and his new tribe on daring raids against his former countrymen. Amid the smoke of battle and in desire's fiercest blaze, he must choose between the two proud peoples who fight for his loyalty and, to the, impassion and the two impassioned women who vie for his soul. Interesting. Let's see when this one was published. Looks like 1996. Okay, this looks like romance. Emma Bonbeck, A Marriage Made in Heaven or Too Tired for an Affair. In this lovingly hilarious book, at her 44 years and counting, marriage to a man who she wouldn't trade for anything in the world, who would finish her sentences, Irma Bonbeck offers observations as only she can on the true test of compatibility, buying a house that needs work, surviving parenthood and the nest that won't stay empty, how times of struggle are a piece of cake compared to handling success, elevating guilt to a sacrament, what to do with a man who saves instruction manuals, thinks a fishing license makes a great anniversary gift, and thanks to the remote control has never seen a televised commercial. Frazzled mothers wondering who they have to sleep with to get fired from the job, Facing maternity, morality, and metamorphosis together, this entertaining portrait of an American marriage is Irma Bombeck at her most infinite, intimate and her funniest. In the historical fiction section? Okay. Let's see what else we got. John Jake's Heaven and Hell. The mighty conclusion to America's best love saga. Oh, okay. I know what this is. This Is this guy who wrote The North and the South? 
Must be. So that's part in a series. Oh my god, this one's gross. <laughs> Look at that. Okay, this is To the North. To the North is a modern love story of remarkable intensity. Okay. Ew. Let's see. Copyright 1932. Interesting. I may have to check that one out just based on when it was. I don't think I've read a love story from that long ago. What we got here. An independent woman. Is it an autobiography? No, it's not. Not by me. From the author of the multi-million selling immigrant saga chronicling the generations of the Levette family through more than a century of American history comes a beautiful intriguing story of one woman's final years of life. From Europe to Israel to her home in San Francisco, this novel follows one of the world's most beloved heroines, Barbara Levitt, as she embarks on a new marriage, faces harrowing hardships, and unexpected challenges and discoveries in her later years. When was this published? Sorry if you can hear the dog. 1997. Dead Man's Poker. Oh, it looks like a Western. I don't mind Westerns. Aurora, Colorado. We all know what happened just now in Colorado. Hashtag gun control now. Aurora, I think, is where... Published 1993. I think Aurora was where the um, movie theater shooting was. Okay, first sentence, because there's no blurb. I was hurt, though how badly, I didn't know. Let's find another one. The Diabolical Baron. I said no romance. Indie book. This was from Indianapolis. Okay. When was this published? 1987. Jason Kincaid, 19th Barrett Radford, was devastatingly handsome, fabulously wealthy, and thoroughly ruthless. What he wanted, he got. And now what he wanted was to win a wager that he could make Miss Caroline Hanscom his bride after her name was drawn out of a hat. True, Caroline was an innocent compared to the Baron. True, the ruling passion of her life was music, to which the Baron turned a deaf ear. True, she found a perfect soulmate in the gallant Captain Richard Davenport, home from the wars and laying siege to their heart. But how could this chit of a girl defy desire of this lord who so easily defeated her every defense as the day of her dreaded marriage came ever closer? and her hopes of escape evaporated one by one. Okay. Oh goodness, another Indian. Hatter Fox, a love story of our time. Hatter Fox is a 17 year old Navajo Indian girl whom we first meet in jail in New Mexico about to knife the prison doctor. Ooh, I like her already. From this shocker opening, we are instantly propelled into the intense, disturbed world that Hatter inhabits. The unbridgeable gap between the safe, same, normal world of the middle-class whites and that of a maverick Indian. This very well-written, that's a red flag, and touching novel has the sleeper potential of I never promised you a rose garden. Okay. Let's see when this was published. 1973. Everybody's all American. What? A stunning novel about a football hero who finds the hurrah don't last. Historical fiction? I don't think so. When was this? 1981. Okay, that might be... That's going in the donate pile. Shaker Run. Kate Marvin thought her recovery from her former husband's betrayal was a new beginning. A quiet and controlled life as the rose gardener on the estate of Sarah Dindy, a wealthy widow, seemed the perfect estate. But when Sarah dies under mysterious circumstances, 
leaving Kate the unexpected heir to Sarah's vast fortune and Shaker furniture. I used to work at a furniture store. The police suspect Kate might have had something to do with Sarah's death. Looking for a refuge again, Kate accepts a job as a gardener at Shaker, at Sh Shaker Run, a historic and once celibate Shaker Village. Okay, so obviously this one features a garden, and I am doing the um, 52 book challenge, which I will link below, and I will, this one fits the prompt of featuring a garden. And you can see up here, I have Emerson's Nature. I was going to use that one, but I think I'm going to use this one. Does it sound wonderful? Not really, but... We'll see. Okay, motherhood, the second oldest profession. We all know what the oldest one is, right? Who's that? God. 1983. Okay, this one's short. We'll read the first sentence. It was one of the luckier women who came to motherhood. Oh, I was one of the yucky. I was one of the luckier women who came to motherhood with some experience. I owned a Yorkshire Terrier for three years. Okay. This is not historical fiction. More Indians. And Cheyenne Autumn. In quest of their homeland over 1,500 miles distance, a band of northern Cheyennes fled the Oklahoma reservations in September 8, 1878 on what would be one of the most harrowing and courageous treks in the history of the American West. The 278 Cheyennes, fewer than half of them adults under the dual chieftaincy of Little Wolf and Dull Knife, had been half starved by their forced encampment. They had little ammunition and a few guns and horses. The United States Army, by the way, the Army and especially the cavalry were awful to the Indians. The United States Army, expecting to thwart the exodus with a minor skirmish, first dispatched a few troops against the handful of warriors. Before the Cheyennes were contained months later, more than 10,000 soldiers had been called to the Great Plains. In the vicious campaign, most of the valiant Cheyennes were annihilated before reaching their home on, on the Yellowstone. Cheyenne Autumn is a distinguished historian's tribute to a tiny band of persecuted people and their defiant struggle against the armed might of a great military power. This sounds interesting. Because being from Texas, we get a lot of uh, criticism about how the Texas Rangers treated the Indians. And I don't think the Cheyennes were particularly a problem to the Rangers, but the Calvary, the U.S. Calvary, were. Um, the Comanches were a problem for the Rangers. Cheyennes were peaceful. So this is interesting. A lot of Westerns. The Blue Hammer. Oh my goodness. Look at her. I don't know what this is about. This is from Aurora 2. When was this published? 1976. Okay, I don't even want to look at that. Dark Trail, another Western. No one's laying out the welcome mat for the latest visitors to Wind River. Looks like a Lonesome Dove knockoff. Ever since the Golden Spike was driven in, completing the Transcontinental Railroad, Heavy traffic through the Wind River in an accompanying influx of stranger has made the jobs of local star packers Cole Tyler and Billy Casebolt to tougher than ever. A blazing gunfight between two miners vying for attentions of a newly of newly arrived prostitutes, a visit from a soft spoken, straight shooting deputy U.S. marshal hell bent on justice, and a group of outlaws with their sights set on the new bank will make things mighty dangerous for the gold, good folks of Wind River. But it is a well-dressed revenge-seeking stranger from New Orleans who really gets the blood boiling and bullets flying in a deadly showdown that could change the face of Wind River forever. Okay, this yeah, this does seem like a lonesome dove knockout. Knock off. Oh my. The pen penetrator? The penetrator. Tokyo Purple. Oh my god, she's naked! I can't show that on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> She was trapped, naked and alone. She was at the mercy of an evil, of an evil giant, a Japanese godfather who wanted to pick her brains. 
And if she wouldn't cooperate, well, there was a number of things he could do with his beautiful American captive. What? No. Let's get about that one. What's this? Okay, here's a bodice ripper. I said, I, I said no. I asked for no romances, but that obviously didn't happen. The no, the nowhere city. Paul, a Harvard historian, ooh, comes to a mythic bazaar, demented Los Angeles to write the official history of the California Corporation. Catherine, his pretty and prim New England wife, follows later, only to find Paul involved in a racy affair with a hip Beckett reading waitress. I love Beckett. Catherine withdraws while Paul relates, moving from his waitress to Gloria Green, the starlet, from Venice to Beverly Hills. And like an endless phalanx of pink Cadillacs, the Los Angeles myth and reality closes in on two on the on the two Cambridge innocents. When the Nowhere City first appeared, Bookweek called it almost flawless. Okay, so this I might actually read. This seems like somebody who wrote it actually knew about literature. <laughs> 1965 what's the first sentence it's so dark in here paul cattleman said don't you want to make me open the window let's see winter's tale this one's long vault into the cold clear air across a frozen fabulous time of love and laughter with peter lake master thief and his flying white horse Sorry if you hear the noise, that's my guinea pigs. Okay, very last book. Original Sin. Brilliant, stellar, elegant. Proves that James has lost none of her power. There is a killer at work at the distinguished publishing house, Peveril Press. A killer whose passions reach deep into the past. Commander Dogly Sheesh and his team are confronted with a puzzle of extraordinary ingenuity in this compelling tale of morality and justice. It's long. Let's see. How long is this? 576. It's a chunker. It's been read. Let's see. When were you published, friend? 1994. Okay, that's not... Oh. I was about to say that's not that old, but... <laughs> Okay, so out of this pile, I think the ones I'm most interested, Miss Hatter over here, she sounds awesome. Um, this one I'm gonna read for the 52 book challenge. Nowhere City, no thank you. Blue Hammer. I'll probably read most of the Indians ones. I, I like that kind of stuff. Uh, and I might honestly read something like this, just <laughs> out of, I mean, come on, how can you not read that? It's just funny. And then I'm going to look at this and see if I'm able, because I personally love family sagas and I like to write family sagas too. So I'm going to see if I'm able to read this without having read North and South, because I haven't read North and South. All right, everyone's all American. This is going straight to the Salvation Army. Baron getting donated. This is disgusting. <laughs> so this might just... Ugh. So yeah, like I said, I only spent $12 on this, so no big deal. White Apache seems okay too. Um, so a few of these are going to go on my TBR. And a few are going to get donated. But yeah, so that was worth it. I made a cute little video and I got one, maybe two three, four, at least five things on my TPR, probably six. Um, so yeah, that, that's a pretty good buy for 12 bucks, 20 bucks. Um, yeah, it was fun. I got some more books. They definitely need to be dusted. They need to be sprayed with Febreze because they don't smell all that great. And thanks for watching. Keeps reading, writing, keep loving words. And I'll see you later. Bye.